Hello. Uh, hi, everyone. It's great to see the interest in testing. Uh, my name is Martin Brown. I'm a developer relations engineer on the Android team, and today we'll untangle coroutine testing together. Uh, as you might know, testing coroutines is not obvious. We have to be able to call suspending functions. We have to think about uh, multi-threaded parallel code running during the tests. Uh, we have to wait for the completion of asynchronous things, um, and we have to manage all of that complexity somehow. So that's what we'll cover today. Uh, luckily, we have a testing library for this uh, from JetBrains, which is Kotlin X Coroutines Test. So we'll be using those APIs um, during this talk. A quick overview of what we'll cover. We'll start from the very basics of uh, just calling into suspending functions in tests. Then we'll uh, take a look at the theory and the overview of the Coroutine Testing API. Uh, we'll take a look at some best practices, uh, some entry specific things, uh, like handling the main dispatcher. And finally, we'll wrap up by taking a look at flows and state flows. So uh, let's get started then with the basics of calling suspending functions in tests. Here's a super simple suspending function to start with. It delays for a second, and then it returns the hello world string. If I want to write a test which uh, asserts the return value of this function, uh, it might look like this. Uh, it calls the function, and then we assert uh, whatever it returned. Uh, this, of course, doesn't work on its own, because we're only allowed to call suspending functions from suspending functions. Uh, so we need to get inside the coroutine to be able to uh, call this function during our test. And this is what coroutine builders serve, uh, bridging the gap of regular blocking code with the world of the suspending uh, with the suspending world of coroutines. Uh, and we have a special coroutine builder in the testing library called runtest that we can use here. And uh, by wrapping our code with runtest, we can already run this test, and it would be successful. A couple of things to point out uh, with this simple example. Uh, first of all, um, runtest will use a test dispatcher implementation under the hood, which we'll take a look at in a bit. But uh, importantly, it will skip that uh, delay that's in the code that we are testing. Uh, so instead of our test taking a bit more than a second, it will complete almost uh, immediately. And uh, you can also see the convention I'm using here uh, to call runtest uh, with an expression body, just returning the result of the runtest call directly from my test function. Uh, this is a nice convention uh, to use with this library. And if you happen to be targeting JavaScript with your tests, it's actually required as well. So uh, that's for a start. What if we start complicating our coroutine code a little bit? Uh, one complication we can introduce is we can switch dispatchers uh, within the code that we're testing. So, for example, in the fetch data function, I can use with context to go to the IO dispatcher and um, do the work of that function there. If we run the code again, our test will still compile and run and pass. However, um, we now have some problems in it. Uh, namely, it will now take an actual second to run the test because the delay is now handled by the IO dispatcher. Um, to visualize this, uh, we'll use um, these visuals where we have two threads represented, one of them the main test thread that we're using, and the other a thread from the IO dispatcher. So as we start our test, we call fetch data, which happens on the test thread. We go into the body of the fetch data function where a with context call happens, taking us from the test thread into the IO dispatcher, where we perform that real one second delay. And as we exit that function and with context, we get back our string and perform an assertion, which is successful. Because we're still returning the correct value, we just have the delay that we really don't want to be a real delay in a test. Some other things that can complicate your testing is if you are creating new coroutines in your test outside of the main test coroutine that RunTest creates for you. So uh, here's a direct example of that, where we have a test that creates a user repository object, and then it uses two new coroutines to register two users in that repository. And finally, we want to assert that the users have indeed been added to the repo. Uh, here, it's obvious that we're creating new coroutines because we have these launch calls right there in the body of the test function. We can also make this less obvious. Here's a super simplified version of a view model, which uh, stores a user and has an initialize function, which can launch a new coroutine using the Jetpack view model scope API. Um, and then that creates a new coroutine uh, to make that fetch happen. Uh, 
Uh, if we're testing this, uh, we might uh, do something like this. We can create an instance of the view model. We call that initialize function to perform the data loading. And then we might want to assert that the user name, uh, that the user object has been set and that they have the correct name, for example. Um, here, even though we are not creating coroutines directly in the test body, we are creating coroutines in the code that we're calling into from the test. Um, so we are still creating new coroutines during the test. Um, as it is right now, both of these tests would fail for various reasons, and we'll examine that in just a moment. However, before we do that, we need to learn about the available coroutine testing APIs in the uh, test library. So, uh, all of this starts with RunTest, which we've already seen. It's a special coroutine builder, uh, which lets us create coroutines for testing purposes. Because all coroutines need to run in a coroutine scope, RunTest has to use a coroutine scope as well, and it uses a test scope um, to run that test coroutine. What test scope does is it will always use a test dispatcher uh, inside it, and, and this is the last concept that I have to introduce, I promise, uh, that will depend on a test coroutine scheduler, which is really the core of the testing library and where most of the implementation actually happens. So, um, while run test creates a test scope and that scope creates a dispatcher, a test dispatcher automatically, uh, you can also create additional test dispatchers during your tests as needed. But something extremely important uh, with this library is that all of these test dispatchers must always share the same scheduler. This is so important that I wrote it out on the slide. Um, so make sure that as you're instantiating new dispatchers, you only have a single scheduler instance uh, within the entire test. And we're going to refer to that uh, later on. So uh, scheduler is where most of the implementation lives. And we have the test dispatchers, which are coroutine dispatchers that depend on this scheduler. And test dispatcher is actually an interface with two different implementations available in the library, standard test dispatcher and unconfined test dispatcher. Both of these uh, rely on the scheduler behind the scenes. Uh, they just have slightly different behavior. Uh, standard test dispatcher will queue up any coroutines um, that you start on it. Uh, it will queue them up on the scheduler and they will only execute when they get time to execute or you uh, advance them manually. And unconfined test dispatcher will start and uh, start executing uh, newly started coroutines um, eagerly. So we'll look at both of these in detail to understand their behavior, starting with standard test dispatcher. So uh, as I said, this queues up coroutines using that scheduler behind the scenes you need to either yield uh, the test thread to them or you can advance them manually. And uh, this is what run test will use by default, or more specifically, when you call run test, it creates a test scope and a test scope will create a standard test dispatcher by default if you don't specify anything else. So uh, let's go back to this test where we saw that we uh, create a repository. We launched those two new coroutines to register Alice and Bob in the two coroutines. And finally, we check that the uh, list of users in the repository after these calls is, uh, contains Alice and Bob. Uh, let's see uh, how this test executes. And um, these launches uh, within the test body um, are being called on the receiver of the Lambda that we're passing into run test, which is the test scope itself. So we are launching this in the test scope and inheriting the standard test dispatcher that's part of the scope by default. So um, let's execute this. We start on the test thread, of course. We create a user repository. This happens on the test thread. Then we launch a new coroutine, which again launches on a standard test dispatcher which means that we don't start running it yet. Instead, we just place this on the scheduler to be executed later. And launch will return immediately without that new coroutine actually running. Um, you might notice that this is very similar to what happens in production code uh, with real dispatchers, where launch is this fire and forget call, where uh, launch itself returns immediately, and then the coroutine that it created will get dispatched when um, the dispatcher can handle it. So uh, we keep running our code here. We go to the next launch. Again, this will create a new coroutine, put it on the scheduler, and return immediately. And that gets us to our assertion, which at this point will fail, because we never actually registered those users. We just created coroutines that would have registered them. So uh, how do we fix this? Uh, we can advance coroutines that are uh, pending on the scheduler manually. Uh, 
we'll take uh, this example of a scheduler state, which has a bunch of different coroutines waiting, and some of them are due right now with no time constraints, and some others are scheduled to be executed after some delays um, at some future time. Uh, the first function we have to be able to advance these is run current. Um, this is a fairly self-explanatory name. Uh, it will start taking the coroutines that are on the scheduler, which are due at the current time, and execute those. Then we have advanced time by, which allows you to fast forward the virtual time that the scheduler is uh, using internally uh, by some amount of milliseconds. For example, let's say that we fast forward by 100 milliseconds and it will advance any of the coroutines, um, it will execute any of the coroutines that were uh, scheduled before that time. Importantly, if you had something pending at exactly the time uh, where you just fast forward it to, it won't be executed yet. And finally, we have a catch-all solution, which is advance until idle. This will just keep taking things off of the scheduler and executing them as long as there's something to do. So these would um, clear our scheduler entirely, executing everything on it. Uh, we could really use any of these to fix the problem we had in our test. We're going to do the simplest thing, which is just call advance until idle. If we now run the test again, we'll see that uh, this will fix it. So we'll first start again by creating the repo. Then we'll perform those two launches, which queue up two coroutines on the scheduler. And as we get into advanced until idle, that will start picking up tasks from the scheduler and executing them. So that means that we would first register Alice, then we would register Bob. And now that the scheduler is idle, advanced until idle would return, we would get to our assertion, and it would be successful because we've now actually registered the users before asserting on it. Okay, that was standard test dispatcher. We'll now look at what unconfined test dispatcher does in contrast to that. Um, again, this will start new coroutines eagerly instead of queuing them up. This might be a good choice for simple tests. However, be careful with it because it really doesn't emulate real concurrency. So if the concurrent behavior of the code that you're calling is an important part of your test at all, you should really be looking at standard test dispatcher uh, to start with and only use unconfined test dispatcher in certain scenarios, some of which we'll look at here. Uh, we can test this, uh, we can try out this dispatcher um, in the existing test that we were working with. And to make run test use it, we can just create an instance of it and pass it in as a parameter to run test. Uh, this way, it will be placed in the test scope that run test creates instead of creating a new test dispatcher uh, in there. And our two launch calls will now inherit that dispatcher from the scope. So these launches will now happen on an unconfined test dispatcher. Let's see uh, how this would execute. So first, we create a repository again. Then we get to our first launch call, which, because it launches on an unconfined test dispatcher, is entered eagerly. So we immediately register Alice within the call to launch, and only then does launch return. Then we go to the next line, we launch a new coroutine, we enter it eagerly, we perform that registration, and then launch returns. And we get to the assertion, which, of course, is successful now. So, uh, to summarize uh, these two dispatchers, uh, standard has a queuing behavior, unconfined has an uh, eager uh, start for coroutines, and you should use standard by default, but there are some use cases for unconfined as well, such as using it for the main dispatcher and for using it in coroutines that collect flows, uh, which can also make your life a bit easier. Okay, uh, with that, let's start looking at some best practices around coroutine testing. And the main point I want to drive home here is injecting dispatchers, which is very important. Um, for this example, we'll use this made up repository class, which depends on a database, and it uses the IO dispatcher for a couple different things. First, it creates its own internal coroutine scope, where it uses the IO dispatcher, and it has an initialize method that launches a new coroutine in that scope on the IO dispatcher, and populates the database with some kind of initial data. Then, it also has a different kind of usage for the IO dispatcher, which again is hard-coded here, uh, which is a suspending function that switches the caller to the IO dispatcher, and then fetches data from the database uh, in there. If we want to test this repository, we might write a test like this. Here we create an instance of it, pass in some fake database implementation, and then we call initialize to uh, set it up with some data. After that, we want to grab the data to assert on it, so we call fetch data and we make an assertion. 
Let's see what happens if we run this code. We'll have the test thread yet again, and now a couple threads from the IO dispatcher represented. So we start, as always, on the test thread. We create our object. Then we call initialize, which, remember, launches a new coroutine um, on the IO dispatcher. Uh, that's denoted here with the dotted line. Uh, so that's a second coroutine in, in addition to the one that run test has created for us. In there, it starts populating the database with data. However, this launch will return immediately because we are just using a production dispatcher. So while that's happening, our main coroutine continues, and we call fetch data, which, again, takes our main coroutine to the IO dispatcher and performs a read of the database there. After that, uh, when the read is done, fetch data returns, and we move on to the last line of our test, which is asserting. And this might be successful if we were lucky enough that that populate call was scheduled quickly enough and completed quickly enough that by the time that we read the database on potentially another thread, uh, the data was already there. Or if we're unlucky, populate was scheduled too late, took too long, and our assertion fails. If we're really unlucky, Populate can just keep going, um, even outside of the scope of the test, because there's nothing that ties it to the test itself and uh, cause side effects during our other test execution, for example. So this is really not ideal. So let's see how injecting dispatchers can help us. So instead of using the IO dispatcher directly in a hard-coded way, we can add a parameter to our repository, which is a coroutine dispatcher, and then use that wherever we were previously using the IO dispatcher directly. We can also make that the default value so that it doesn't have to be provided um, in production code um, every time. A quick side note here, uh, you have other options than injecting a coroutine dispatcher. If you want, you can also inject the broader coroutine context type that lets you do things like um, specify other elements of the uh, coroutine context for testing purposes, uh, pass in an empty coroutine context if you want to. And if you only need um, to start new coroutines in your test, but you don't need the uh, context switching part of it, uh, you can also consider injecting a coroutine scope. Um, it's the same idea between, uh, behind all of these uh, different options. In this talk, we'll cover dispatchers, but you can check our testing guidance for the rest. So um, we're going to stick with dispatcher for now. Uh, let's see how this changes our test. Uh, we now have to provide two parameters to the repository. In addition to the database, we want to pass in a, a, cor a coroutine dispatcher. So I'll create a new standard test dispatcher object for this. And I'll make sure, again, remi remember, always share the one test scheduler that exists within your coroutine tests. Uh, so I'll grab the test scheduler property of the test scope that we're working with and pass that in to the newly created standard test dispatcher. Let's see how the code executes now with this change. We create the repository. We call initialize, which launches on the test dispatcher now, which we injected. So that will queue up a new coroutine on the scheduler because we're on a standard test dispatcher. Then initialize returns. And I've already added an advanced until idle call here um, because I knew that this was going to happen. So um, that will pick up the waiting coroutine and execute it. So by the time that we go to the next line, where we used to go to the IO dispatcher, we now switch context to the standard test dispatcher. So we just remain on the same thread again and perform the database read there. And because everything was nice and sequential now, uh, we can perform our assertion without having to worry about race conditions. There is an important note here, which is that this shouldn't be happening in a test. So uh, let's... Um, recognize what the repository class is doing. It has this initialize method, which internally launches a new coroutine to load data asynchronously. And the callers of the repository have to know when that asynchronous work completes inside the repository, because its other methods, like fetch data, are only safe to call after the data has been loaded. Uh, but the repository doesn't give any indication to the outside world of when this asynchronous work will complete. So we need to work around it. So uh, injecting a dispatcher here and using the test APIs to advance the pending coroutines is something that can be done in tests, but you wouldn't be able to do this in production code. In production code, you would be guessing whether or not this asynchronous work has completed, which is really not ideal. 
So if this work has to be asynchronous, uh, you can consider doing something like this, uh, using the async builder and returning a deferred object, which is obvious that it can be awaited at the call site, and then that works in tests and in production code. Or you might just review this and realize that the initialize method does not have to work asynchronously, and it might just be that it could be a simple suspending function like this. All right, uh, let's touch on something Android specific, which is handling the main dispatcher. Um, usually, uh, when you use the main dispatcher, there are cases where you can inject it the exact same way as we've just seen by adding it as a constructor parameter to whatever classes need to call into the main dispatcher. But there are APIs that don't allow you to do that. For example, here's a view model which uses the Jetpack view model scope API. Uh, it has a state flow where it stores a uh, message. And it has a method to load that message by creating a new coroutine. And here I'm just directly uh, writing a value into the state flow, um, but pretend that uh, that coroutine is doing some kind of um, useful loading work. So uh, here, ViewModel scope doesn't allow us to inject a test dispatcher for testing purposes. Uh, it has a hard-coded main dispatcher internally. So if we try to run this test, um, which creates a view model, calls load message, and then wants to assert that the state close value has been updated, this test would actually crash when we try to access the main dispatcher in it, because we don't have access to the real Android UI thread in a unit test. Um, and we cannot inject a test dispatcher in its place either. Uh, luckily for us, the exception message does point us to a uh, possible solution which is that we can use dispatcher's set main from the testing library. So let's see how that's done. Uh, set main takes a test dispatcher instance as a parameter. So I can create a test dispatcher here, again, making sure that I share that scheduler from the test scope, um, and I can pass that in to set main. Then there's also a corresponding teardown method, which is dispatcher's reset main, um, so that this uh, test dispatcher that we've statically set up to be the main dispatcher whenever it's referenced uh, can be cleared at the end of the test. So I can, for example, surround all of my test code with a try finally, and then at the end of that, make sure that I reset the main dispatcher. So running this code, uh, this assertion and this test would now be successful when inside loads, load message, we launch a new coroutine on the view model scope. That launch will actually happen on the test dispatcher that we've set up to be the main dispatcher. Something interesting to note here is that I've used an unconfined test dispatcher this time to um, be the stand-in to, to be the mocked version of the main dispatcher. And the reason for this is that I wanted it to launch coroutines eagerly. Uh, this is because ViewModel Scope also has a similar behavior. Uh, internally, it uses dispatcher's main immediate, uh, which has a behavior that if you call the load message method from the main thread, then launching something on the immediate main dispatcher will enter that coroutine eagerly without having to wait for an extra dispatch. So by using unconfined test dispatcher here, uh, I have the same scheduling behavior in my test as I would have in production code when I call the load message function from the UI thread. Uh, this pattern of set main, reset main in every one of our coroutine tests that uh, needs to reference main dispatcher is not convenient, so we can, of course, extract this. Uh, for example, uh, sticking with JUnit 4 here, but you can find alternatives in all of the other uh, testing frameworks as well, um, I can create a test rule which sets the main dispatcher uh, at the start of each test and then resets it after each test. And as you can see, I'm creating an unconfined test dispatcher here as the default value of that dispatcher. To use this rule, I would have to create an instance of it uh, and place it into the task class I have as a property and annotate it with the rule annotation. And since this will handle setting and resetting the main dispatcher for me, my test code can now focus on what I actually want to test, which is creating the view model and then calling various things on it. An interesting question at this point is whether or not I've managed to do scheduler sharing properly again there must only be one scheduler in your tests. And we know that run test will create a scheduler, and we've seen that we create a dispatcher inside uh, the main dispatcher rule, so that also probably creates a scheduler. The good news is that the testing library has this very convenient behavior, where if you place a test dispatcher 
into the main dispatcher by calling set main, then any test dispatcher created after that point in time will look at main first, and if there's a test dispatcher there already, grab its scheduler and share it. So that means that, before, that because we are setting main before the test, run test will automatically share that scheduler in the background. And if I were to create additional test dispatchers during my test, that would also be safe to do because main has been set. And whenever these test dispatchers are being constructed, they will look at main and grab the scheduler from there. OK. Uh, so that was a bunch of things around regular coroutines, suspending functions. We learned about um, injecting dispatchers. And now I want to move on to looking at flows. Uh, for our first example of flows, um, I will have this example where we have a data source that's producing a flow of ints, and we'll have a repository that depends on this data source. And it basically just takes that flow from the data source and applies a very, very simple transformation of multiplying each number by 10. Uh, in a real application, you would have repositories that have multiple data sources, combine data from those, apply complex transformations and more logic, but the general idea would remain the same. To visualize this, uh, to make a test that can work with the repository that um, uses flows, we'll create a fake data source to control what values the repository is receiving. And then we'll collect the flow that the repository is exposing from our test and make assertions on the values that it produces. To do that, we need a fake implementation. And an easy way to fake a flow is to use just hard-coded values. So this will be a cold flow, which is why I'm calling this a cold fake data source, uh, which whenever it's collected, will just return one, two, three, and four. So testing this, we can go to a test method like this, which again uses run test because we'll be making suspending calls in there. We create the repository, passing in our fake data source. From here, I can use various terminal operators on flows to grab, grab values out of the flow that the repository is exposing. So for example, I can grab the flow from the repository and call first on it to collect just the first value and assert that uh, the one that the data source produced has actually been multiplied by 10. Or I can also collect all of the values from the flow that the repository has into a list, assuming that the list that the flow is finite and the entire thing can be collected. Uh, and then I can make assertions on individual values or the size of the list, for example. And in cases where I don't want to collect all the values of a flow or the flow is not finite, so I couldn't collect all the values of a flow, I can use simple flow operators. For example, I can take just the first two values of the flow, collect those into the list, and then make assertions on that list. We can also do more dynamic and more interesting uh, faking of that data source. Here's a implementation which uses a hot flow internally, uh, specifically a mutable shared flow. So we have a mutable shared flow that's stored in our fake data source, and this is the flow that the interface method of the data source will return. And to control when and what values this emits, we've added an emit method on the fake itself that we can use to feed values into the flow. Let's see how we can use this. So we'll create an instance of the data source, we'll pass it into the repository, then I'll create a mutable list here, which I'll use as the list where I collect the values that the repository is producing. Then I will create a new coroutine here because I want to collect values from the repository and collect is a suspending call, which will only return if the collection is complete. And in this case, I have a hot flow backing all of this, which will never complete. So I don't want to do this in the middle of my test. I want it to run concurrently with the rest of the uh, test code that will write. So I'm launching a new coroutine to do this collection. And uh, sorry, and I'm using an unconfined test dispatcher here uh, to make sure that I enter this coroutine eagerly. So by the time that launch returns and we move on to the next line of our test, the new coroutine that we created here will already be waiting on the uh, line where we are collecting the flow and will be ready to process any values that the repository produces. I can also make this a bit shorter. Uh, so instead of using collect directly, I can just use to list, which also collects the flow internally, and I can specify a target list where the values should go. Okay, uh, with this setup of a coroutine, which is ready to collect uh, from the flow, 
I can now start emitting values from the data source, which the repository will receive, process, uh, perform the transformation on it, and then my coroutine that I started a couple lines earlier will collect it and place it into the list. So I can emit from the data source, and on the next line, I can check that uh, all of this has actually happened, and I ended up with the correct value in the list. Um, small problem here um, is that the coroutine that I launched here, as I said, will never complete because we're, launch because we're collecting a hot flow, ultimately. Um, so our test would hang and time out eventually uh, because uh, run test usually waits for uh, coroutines to complete that we started as children of run test. So in order for my test to be able to complete successfully, I need to uh, somehow shut down this coroutine at the end of the test. And one way to do that is to just save the job that launch returned and then cancel it explicitly at the end of the test like this. Or with the latest coroutine APIs, we also have a property called background scope available on test scope. And basically anything you launch in this uh, coroutine scope will be canceled automatically at the end of the test. So if you have coroutines that you know uh, will keep going forever and you don't mind that um, they are still pending at the end of the test and will be canceled, uh, you can place those coroutines in this scope. And for example, this is a great way um, to collect uh, flow values. And from here, with this setup that we have that collecting coroutine, which will be shut down eventually, we can just keep dynamically feeding new values through the data source. The repository uh, will process them, we collect it on the other end, and we can keep making assertions against the list of values that we have. A uh, quick note here, uh, we won't look at its APIs in detail, but there's also Turbine, which is a really nice uh, testing utility library for flows. Um, and it can, for example, uh, create that collecting coroutine for flows for you, and then give you some convenient APIs to grab the values that it collected and make assertions on it. So you might want to check that out to test flows. Okay, uh, moving on, I want to cover state flows uh, to wrap up things with, as they also require extra considerations uh, to test them. State flows have this interesting duality, where they are a state holder, so they have a value, which is a current value that they are storing, but they are also a stream of values. Uh, they are a flow, which means that they can be collected, and collectors will receive the new values that are written into the state flow over time. For this example, uh, we'll move one layer higher up in our architecture and we'll have a repository interface uh, that's producing a flow of ints and we'll have a view model that depends on that and collects those values. Um, so inside that view model, uh, here is the state flow that we want to test. Uh, it's a mutable state flow that starts from zero. It's exposed to the public as a uh, regular state flow. And we have an initialized method inside the view model, which launches a new coroutine, and in there collects the flow from the repository. And as values are coming in, it's just placing them into the state flow, which the UI can then um, depend on. To visualize what's happening here, we'll have a fake repository implementation. The view model will collect uh, values from the repository and write them into a state flow, and then we'll read those values from our test code. We'll start with a hot fake implementation here immediately, uh, skipping the um, hard-coded uh, fake that we saw earlier for regular flows, uh, because I want to control which values are emitted when during the test. Um, so again, this is very much the same setup as before. We have a mutable shared flow to back the uh, fake implementation, and we have a method on the fake to feed values into that shared flow. For our test, we'll assume that we have the main dispatcher rule set up, just so that I can use view model scope and uh, I don't have to worry about scheduler sharing uh, within my test, but I will move this off of the slide uh, because I need more space. But remember that the reason why I'm not handling scheduler sharing here is because I have the main dispatcher set. So inside a test, we create a fake, we pass it into the object under test, which is our view model. And after that, we can already start making assertions. Uh, for example, we can assert on the initial value of the state flow inside the view model. Then we can call initialize, which creates that new coroutine, which will collect values from the repository. And as they are coming in, writing them into the state flow of the view model. After this, 
we can control the repository, we can emit values from it by calling the emit method on the fake, and we can make assertions on the view model that the value has been collected and placed inside the state flow. And we can keep doing this, again, dynamically controlling which values are coming from the repository, and then making assertions at various points um, on the view model side. Something important here is that I keep asserting on the current value of the state flow instead of collecting it as a flow. And uh, it's our recommendation to treat state flows as state holders in your tests, uh, wherever you can, um, and control um, the work that makes changes to that state flow, um, so that you can keep asserting on the value property instead of having to collect it especially because state flows have a behavior which is that if they receive values quickly uh, in like rapid succession, um, you might not observe all of those new values that have been written into the state flow um, if you're collecting from it. So uh, whether or not you'll see all intermediate values if the state flow's value is changing quickly will depend on how the producing and the consuming coroutines are set up um, and how fast they are in terms of scheduling. Um, so that's something difficult to handle um, and control well in tests. So instead of having to worry about conflation, we recommend just asserting on the value. Okay, uh, I want to make one more note uh, around state flows, which has to do with using state in. So I've had this whole setup here in the previous example where view model depends on repository, grabs a flow, and basically just transforms it into a state flow, but I've written a lot of code for it, right? Um, if you know the state in operator, uh, that can actually do the exact same thing with a lot less code. So I can just call the method that gives me the flow of the repository, call state in on it, and that will do the exact same thing of transforming it into a state flow that I can then read from the UI side. What happens to our test if we make this change in the view model? Well, our assertions on the initial value will continue working, but if we emit a new value from the repository and want to check that the view model collected it and updated the value of the state flow, that will actually fail. So while the initial value is correct, uh, using state in is somehow not updating the value and not collecting things uh, from the repository. So let's talk about why that happens. The reasoning here uh, has to do with the sharing started parameter of state in. So this parameter says that Staten will only create its internal coroutine that it uses to collect the flow that we called it on when it has a subscriber, when someone is collecting this state flow. Um, so basically, for this coroutine to exist, which is grabbing things from the repository um, inside Staten uh, and writing into the view model, we also have to have a collector on the test side of things. But we are not doing that in our test, right? I just said that we are not collecting the state flow in the test. Instead of doing that, we just keep reading individual values. So um, the other coroutine will also not exist, which would be consuming from the repository and writing into the view model. And we just keep reading the same value over and over again from the view model um, instead of seeing new values at any point. Also, the same would happen if we were using the lazily parameter for sharing started, uh, which also only starts that coroutine if someone's collecting the state flow. So uh, what can we do if we don't want to change our implementation from state in? Because state in is very nice and concise, and a lot of people are familiar with it. Well, uh, we can just create a fake collector in this case. So just to make sure uh, that we have someone collecting it and that state in will be active during the test, we can launch a new coroutine to collect from the state flow and just ignore all of those values. So here we have a new coroutine that is collecting the state flow but not consuming the values in any uh, meaningful way. And we are again using the background scope API to do this so that this collecting coroutine will be shut down automatically at the end of the test. And if we run our test again, we can now see that this started working. All right, uh, let's summarize uh, what we learned today. So use run test, first of all, to uh, test coroutines. Inject dispatchers into your classes to make them testable. You can create additional test dispatchers as needed, but always, always, always share a single scheduler, please. Uh, you can replace the main dispatcher in unit tests by calling setMain, which also will simplify sharing schedulers. And you, sh you can use background scope for coroutines like flow collection, which you want to be shut down at the end of the test.
Uh, here are some resources uh, around this uh, that we have. So we have a coroutine testing guide and a flow testing guide in the Android documentation, uh, which includes all of this and a lot more. Um, so uh, check that out. And again, uh, if you're working on flows, um, consider using the Turbine library for that. Uh, thank you so much for attending this talk. Please don't forget to vote for the talk and rate it in the app. Uh, and you can also find us at the Google booth. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll try to head there uh, after this talk as well. And I think that's it. Uh, do we have time for questions? Yeah, we have five minutes. We have five minutes for questions. Yeah, we can handle a couple of questions. Hi, thanks for, for the great talk. I wanted to ask, back to the view model testing, why shouldn't we inject um, a closable scope, just like, you know, that will mimic the view model scope in production and just be a test scope in, for the tests, similar to what we do for the repository that you showed? Okay, so, so why shouldn't you inject a curtain scope instead of using view model scope? scope? Yeah, a closable scope, yeah. Just like the view model scope that mimics uh, in production, yeah. Yeah, uh, you can absolutely do that. So if, if you want to... Uh, Instead of, I mean, you know, uh, resetting the main dispatcher like we do now. Uh, so, sorry, can you repeat that? Instead, like the with using the main dispatcher rule like we do now, basically, just replace that with an um, injected uh, scope. Yes, yeah. So, so as as I said on the like injecting dispatchers part, you can also choose to inject a uh, scope instead, and you can do that with view models as well. So, you you can create your own scope for the view model, inject it as a constructor parameter. And basically, all you have to worry about is making sure that you cancel that scope when the view model is cleared, um, which you can also find APIs to do now. So mm -hmm. you, you can use your own scope instead of view model scope, and then um, you wouldn't necessarily have to um, set main anymore. But you would lose the convenience scheduler sharing. Like uh, setting main in a static way is maybe not an ideal way of mocking it, but it's very convenient that it helps you with the scheduler sharing part of things. So that's like a trade-off to consider there. I see, thanks. Um, I'm pretty sure I know the inevitable answer to this question, but I am curious. Um, if you are, if your coroutines code interoperates with existing legacy um, Java async frameworks or the like that don't interact with any of the scheduler stuff, can you use any of this? Can you use any of this if you're interoping with other asynchronous solutions? Yeah, uh, no. I don't know. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a good question to follow up on. Uh, I think I think we're out of time, more or less. So thank you very much, and okay, that's it. yeah, thank you. Uh, come to the Google booth. <laughs> <laughs>